Hi everybody, welcome to session 3.7 where we're going to talk about debt. For this class session, I want you to be able to demonstrate how the concept of leverage works. I want you to be able to explain four sources of debt that are common for organizations, including nonprofits. Those are secure debt, bridge loans, private activity bonds, and lines of credit. And then we're going to talk about some best practices for debt management. We're going to talk about something called a debt service coverage ratio, and we're going to talk about some tips related to managing bankruptcy. Okay, first some debt basics. Why is it that a nonprofit would borrow? Because most people don't think of nonprofits as organizations that would borrow money. And so um, it's important to understand why they would. And the answer is they would borrow for the same reason other, other organizations would. One is for cash flow smoothing. So the, so the idea is that you might have punctuated moments of high revenue during the course of the year and you sort of spend into that revenue. And then like if you have two big fundraising events a year, for example, you may find that you fall short before the next big fundraising event comes up and borrowing is a way to smooth your cash flow across those periods. Pretty much all businesses, large businesses anyway, use borrowing for this purpose where they may borrow for a day or two in order to make a payroll and then they get a big payment from uh, customers. And so cash flow smoothing is a really common reason to borrow. Another reason is for capital purchases. This is anytime you need to buy new equipment, a new building, vehicles, uh, large uh, amounts of inventory. The, the purpose of this is to buy these things that help you carry out the work that you do. Um, but then the third reason to borrow is leverage. And I'm going to explain this concept of leverage uh, to help you get a sense of what this is all about. Before we get to leverage, though, I want to stress a few other things. Um, just some other concepts that relate to debt. It's important to understand the difference between recourse versus non-recourse debt. If debt is recourse debt, it means that the um, borrower, or sorry, the lender uh, is, it, sorry, let me rephrase. Recourse debt means that the lender can go after your personal assets. Non-recourse debt means the only thing they can get is whatever was serving as collateral for the loan, but everything else you have is protected. Small organizations, if they want to borrow, often have to have individual co-signers. So you might be the founder of a nonprofit and you need to borrow money. Uh, if a bank is willing to give you a loan, they might do it on the condition that you as the founder also guarantee the loan. Um, when that happens, that's recourse debt, which means that they can go after the nonprofit's assets, but also after your assets. And so it's important to understand when that when when debt is recourse versus non-recourse. It's important to emphasize also that leases functionally operate like that. If you make a promise to pay rent in an office facility for 10 years, uh, it's a lease, but in reality, it's a promise to pay, which functions like debt as far as your finances are concerned. And then one last point to make is that if, you, if debt is ever forgiven, it counts to income to you for tax purposes because it's as though the person gave you money. Now, for a nonprofit, generally, that's not an issue because income is tax-free. But if the debt relief income relates to an unrelated business, then you might owe unrelated business income tax on that amount. Um, but this is true for people, too, for individuals. If you have a debt forgiven, that counts as income to you. Okay, so back to the idea of leverage, because this is an idea I want to, to explore as it relates to nonprofits. And first, I'm going to illustrate what it's like for a regular investment opportunity, you know, the kind of thing a business might be engaged in. So let's pretend that we've got a business that has $1,000 set aside. It can borrow money at a 4% interest rate, but this opportunity they have in front of them will return 6% on their on their investment. So if they take that thousand dollars and put it into this activity, they'll get a six percent return on their on their investment. One of their options is to invest their savings only. So they essentially take that thousand dollars and they put it into the investment opportunity and they get a net return of sixty dollars. And that's good, but it could be better. And the way you make you make it better is by borrowing. And this is where you leverage your savings. So you use the $1,000 in savings as collateral, and then you borrow an additional $9,000 in debt. So that now you have $10,000 to invest in this opportunity instead of just 1000 Well, the way this works is you invest the $10,000 and get your return, so you get $10,600 back. But you owe $9,000 to the bank. And with interest, the total amount that you owe is $9,360. Well, when you do the math on subtracting what you owe from what you got in return on your investment, your net return now is $240. And that's 
better and higher than the net return of $60 when you invested just your own money. So this concept of leverage works because the, if the cost of borrowing is less than the financial return you get from whatever activity you're engaged in, then it makes sense to borrow. And uh, obviously you have to contemplate the risks associated with it and every investment has risks, but a lot of them are relatively safe. And so there are times where if, you, if your cost of borrowing is less than your financial return, then that's the reason you engage in leverage. Most companies, a reasonable size, are leveraged, which means that they borrow money. And in fact, investors, when they look at companies, will look to see if they are under leveraged, meaning the investors will worry if the company hasn't borrowed enough money. And the reason is because if they're not willing to borrow money to carry out their activity, then maybe the invest then, then maybe the investor should be worried about their confidence in, in their in their activity. Because if they're worried about the risk of borrowing, then they should also be worried about the risk of how they might mismanage invested dollars. So that's the concept of leverage in a traditional business case. But let me talk to you, let me talk you through how it worked for a nonprofit. And here instead of a return on investment, here we're talking about an imp impact return. So the idea here is you make the world a better place um, by, a, by, by some measurable amount. And we're going to pretend it's improving the world by 6%. Well, the nonprofit could take its money, its $1,000 in savings, and invest it and create an impact worth $1,060. Or alternatively, they could leverage their savings to borrow money to create that impact. And you'll notice the math works largely the same, but the big difference here is what you see at the bottom right corner. The problem is, is if, you, if a nonprofit borrows money to invest in its impact, then it is going to have to repay that money over time and it doesn't get a financial return to repay the debt. So the amount that's, so even though the nonprofit can create an impact of $10,600, which is much higher than the 1060 they had using their own savings, that's a lot of impact that they can have, but they need to come up with $9,300 to pay back to the lender that helped them achieve that, that impact. The, the math is still compelling in the sense that borrowed money it, it here is, is increasing the impact of the organization. It's a rational strategy as long as the amount that's owed to the bank can be repaid some way. So the lessons to take from this are first that money spent today has a higher impact than money spent later. Uh, that's always true. Um, and uh, as long as the way you're spending it truly generates impact. If it's not, why are you doing it? But um, this, if you remember, reflects the concept we learned with Rosenberg's rule. This also, this concept of leverage basically means that if the borrowing cost is lower than the impact return, borrowing to fund impact is smart if the nonprofit has a way to repay the loan. That's the trick. And so if the nonprofit has regular sustained fundraisers over time, for example, then it would make sense for a nonprofit to borrow rather than saving up its money. I had a student once whose husband was a, a, a financial a CFO for hire, a chief financial officer for hire. So he'd, he'd help different companies manage their finances as they grew. So he understood the concept of leverage really well. Well, he and his wife went to a fundraiser for a nonprofit. And at that fundraiser, they were bragging about how after 20 years, they had finally saved up enough cash to build a new building. Well, the husband actually turned to his wife at that moment and said, hey, we need to leave. This nonprofit is not trustworthy with money. And the reason that was true is because they didn't recognize that borrowing would actually help them have their impact much sooner. In the 20 years that they were saving up money, they could have been having an impact and just paying interest. And that would have been a worthwhile return. Um, and so, so it's important that nonprofits borrow because it helps them increase their impact and have an impact today rather than later. The trick is that donors don't love the idea that their donation pays off the debt of a nonprofit. They would rather think to themselves, well, it's, it, I want my donation to help people not to just pay off a debt. When they think that way, they're not thinking it all the way through. Because if, if let's say a nonprofit borrowed money to build a building and because of it, they could serve two times the number of children. And then they go to the donor and they say, hey, we have this debt as we pay off the mortgage on this building that we built. Would you like to make a donation to help us pay off that mortgage? Most donors would turn their nose up at it, which is strange because really they should be thinking to themselves, wow, I get to retroactively guarantee that my donation has impact because I've seen the impact this new building has had on all these kids. And now I'm the donor that's paying for that. It's actually a chance for the donor to, to make a risk-free risk -free impact, high-impact donation. 
So the reality is donors aren't thinking about this rationally when they don't like paying off debt. Because if the debt led to high impact, the donor is now the benefactor of that impact and they should be happy with it. But for whatever reason, donors only like paying for new impact, not pre-existing impact. And the reality is if you're a donor, you should be happy to be the funder of that impact that has already occurred because it was funded originally by a loan. So that's the concept of leverage as it applies to nonprofits and it's the reason that it's rational for nonprofits to borrow today. Let's talk about a few debt vehicles. These are ways that nonprofits can borrow money. One of them is through secured debt. This is any time a loan is, is protected with some sort of collateral, meaning the lender can take away some sort of property if you don't pay. Um, collateralized debt can take a lot of forms. Most of us as consumers experience it when we buy a car with a car loan, for example. Car loans are collateralized or secured, which means that the lender can take the car away if you don't pay your, your car loan. Well, with businesses, all kinds of things can serve as collateral. Inventory or future inventory, accounts receivable or future accounts receivable, all sorts of things like that can serve as collateral for a secured loan. Um, secured debt is always represented by what's called a security agreement, and that's filed with the state. It's a way to tell the rest of the world that the collateral that's being that's securing the loan belongs to the lender if the person doesn't repay. These security instruments that are filed with the state are, are they prevent businesses from using collateral on multiple loans, the same piece of collateral on multiple loans. And this is usually made for buying equipment. These loans are usually made for buying equipment or capital improvements or other things like that. Okay, bridge loans are short-term loans, and they're usually given to overcome a temporary cash shortfall. So they're usually measured in months, not years. Um, they come with a higher rate of interest. And uh, banks are usually only willing to give bridge loans if there's a clear repayment source. So if you have a big fundraiser in May, but because of the current circumstances, you can't repay, or you're running short on payroll uh, cash, then you could borrow money now in a bridge loan if, as long as you can show that this fundraiser that happens every May brings in the same amount year after year and is reliable and so forth. And that's what would make a bank willing to give you a bridge loan. Um, they're not the most efficient loans available in terms of the cost, but they are handy uh, in the case of an emergency. Private activity bonds are different because it's not the nonprofit borrowing the money. It's actually a municipality that borrows the money. So this happens when a city decides, hey, we need some sort of program activity in our community, but we don't want to run it as a city. We'd rather it was run by some independent nonprofit. And so that might be, for example, a city that really wants a health clinic because they don't have one or a rec center, but they don't want to be in charge of running the rec center. So what will happen is the city will borrow the money through a bond and then uh, taxpayers repay the bond through the city over time. But the proceeds of the bond are granted to a nonprofit that then carries out the activity. Um, it has to be a 501c3 organization for a private activity bond to qualify. Another thing that's cool about these is that like other municipal bonds, the investor's income from the bond is tax-free. So if you were the lender, the person who bought the bond from the city, then your investment return doesn't come with an income tax. The last thing we're going to talk about are lines of credit. These are basically like credit cards, but for businesses. This is a standing debt account that can be called on as needed. Um, you know, you might have, for example, a $100,000 line of credit with a, with a local bank. Um, just like with a credit card, interest is only due on the amount that's actually been borrowed from the line of credit. So it's like a credit card in every way so far. The exception to here is the third bullet. A line of credit usually carries a retirement phase of some kind, meaning usually it's about a year long, which means that you have to repay the full amount owed uh, on the line of credit, close it out, and then you can reboot it. And so you might have a $100,000 line of credit that you've dipped into over the course of the year. By the end of the year, you have to repay everything that's owed. There's a sunset on the line of credit, and then it can get restarted. That's different than a credit card. With credit cards, Companies are have the lenders are happy for you to carry a balance for as long as you live, but um, with lines of credit, you usually have to close up or, or or retire the line of credit by paying it back. Okay, so those are the some debt vehicles that uh, are available to nonprofit organizations. I want to talk about debt management now to wrap this up. 
Um, I first want to talk about a concept called a debt service coverage ratio or debt service ratio. This essentially is a measurement of how, um, how well you can manage your debt obligations. As a business, banks will use this calculation if you want to borrow money. So uh, what they do is they figure out how much you want to borrow. They figure out what that equates to in regular payments. And then they take those regular payments and weigh them against how much cash you bring in, how much surplus cash you bring in. And so it's a really simple measurement. You basically look for unrestricted net income. So this is all of the income you bring in uh, that uh, after expenses. So after you pay for your operations, do you have a surplus of money? And if so, how much is it? And then you divide that amount by the debt payments involved. And that's principles and interest and also any leases. And so one of the ways you can measure if a nonprofit has a healthy amount of debt is by taking their unrestricted net income. And uh, so after they pay for their operations, but before if they pay for their debts, you take that number and then you divide it by the amount that they pay on a regular basis for their debts and leases. And then that will give you a ratio. Um, if it's negative, that's sorry, if it's less than one, that's bad because it means the nonprofit doesn't have enough money to make its debt payments. If it's above one, that's good. A healthy ratio is at least 1.1 which means that they always have surplus cash after paying off their debts. So the way you would calculate this for your finance assignment is you look at, so you look at their operational expenses, not including debt payments. So you take all their other expenses and subtract them from the revenue. And that gives you unrestricted net income. And then you divide that number by how much they pay in debt payments. And so any debt obligations they have or leases. And so in an audited financial statement, uh, you should be able to find these numbers and calculate their debt service coverage ratio. Now, not every nonprofit that borrows money is successful in paying it back. And so non some nonprofits like Boy Scouts of America, for example, have to declare bankruptcy. And I just want to share a few tips, legal tips that relate to bankruptcy. Number one is the way bankruptcy works is a trustee takes over control of your financial assets. The trustee is usually court appointed. And so this person is now has the legal control of all of your financial assets. Uh, when you're going through the bankruptcy process, you have to disclose all of these assets so the trustee can take control of them. If you decide to hide assets from the trustee, like kind of you want to keep some money secret so that way the creditors don't get it, then you can actually lose bankruptcy protection. A nonprofit manager might be tempted to do this, for example, because they will think to themselves, hey, you know what, we've got this sort of side bank account here. And if I can just protect that until we get out of our bankruptcy period, then I can use that to pay my employees to tell them thank you for going through such a hard time. Well, if you were to do something like that and the trustee found out about it, you'd lose bankruptcy protection altogether, which would certainly lead to the doom of the organization. The whole point of bankruptcy is to be able to come out of it someday and be able to operate again in a trustworthy way. And so if you are dishonest in the bankruptcy process, you're just going to be left to the creditors and they'll eventually lead that the lawsuits from that would lead to your demise. It's also important to know that things you do prior to bankruptcy can actually be retroactively changed or voided by the bankruptcy trustee. Using that example of trying to set aside money that you could pay to your employees later, another temptation is to pay out a, a, a bonus to all of your employees before you declare bankruptcy. So maybe a month before bankruptcy starts, you think to yourself, hey, you know what? We've got this extra cash that just came in from a donor. Let's pay a big bonus to all of our employees because things are going to get bumpy here. Well, if you do that, the bankruptcy trustee can actually go backwards sometimes as far as six to nine months and and undo those transactions. So if you'd made an, an irregular bonus payment to your employees, the bankruptcy trustee would actually have the authority to go tell the employees to give that money back, which you don't want them to have to do. So don't try to play games leading into bankruptcy because that can cause problems too. And I'll just stress this. Bankruptcy always seems like such a dire, a dire step, like it's so tragic if it happens. But just remember, bankruptcy is always, always, always better than prison. And if, you're fraud if you are fraudulent during the bankruptcy period, um, you can go to jail. So don't do it. Okay, here, there are some questions we'll talk about together in class about debt as it relates to nonprofits. But that covers everything I want to cover today. So we'll see you then.